From the KPFK studios in Southern California, it's the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Stand up, stand up, you've been sitting way too long. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. My name is Steve Scrovan, along with my co-host David Feldman. Hello, David. Hello, sir. We have another doctor on the show today, David. I know you love to have doctors on the show. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. He loves anytime you can get free advice. <laughs> this isn't the kind of doctor I need. <laughs> I I'm having an emotional crisis, but this is a different show. Well, here's a man who I'm sure is not having an emotional crisis, and that's the man of the hour, Ralph Nader. Hello, Ralph. Hello, everybody. We have very useful information coming straight to our listeners today, and you'll see what I mean, listeners. That's right. Regular listeners know that Ralph frequently asks our guests if they have ever been on NPR or PBS. Well, he won't need to ask that question today. Forget Terry Gross. Our next guest today has been on Oprah. Today, we will be joined by the world-renowned Dr. Andrew Weil, who many of you know as a leader in the field of integrative medicine. Integrative medicine, and I know this because I looked it up, is an approach to patient care that takes into account not just the physical, but also the emotional, mental, social, spiritual, and environmental influences that affect a person's health, which means a person's health is not merely defined as the absence of disease. In particular, we're going to be discussing Dr. Weil's book, Mind Over Meds, which addresses the problem of overmedication and is essentially a patient's guide to knowing when you need and when you don't need to take drugs. So please pay close attention to that. Also on the show today, we will be talking to Robert Tignor, a professor of history at Princeton University, who, along with a couple of other colleagues, drafted a statement calling for the denuclearization of the Middle East. Now, most of the talk about nuclear weapons in the Middle East in the past 15 years has involved the countries of Iraq and Iran, neither of which has ever actually ever possessed nuclear weapons. The only country in the Middle East that does is Israel. Israel is estimated to possess as many as 150 nuclear warheads. And this statement drafted by Professor Tignor has been signed by many prominent intellectuals and activists, including Noam Chomsky, Chris Hedges, and our very own Ralph Nader. We look forward to talking to Professor Tignor about that statement, which recommends that American political decision makers, as well as Israeli political leaders, need to rethink their political, military, economic, and cultural policies in the region. In between these two heavyweight interviews, we'll take a short break and see what kind of heavy lifting corporate crime reporter Russell Mokhyber is doing over at the National Press Building in Washington, D.C. And if we have time, we'll try to address some listener questions. But first, let's go to the doctor. Dr. Andrew Weil is director of the Arizona Center for Integrative Medicine at the University of Arizona and an internationally recognized expert for his views on leading a healthy lifestyle. Among his many publications, is the book Mind Over Meds, Know When Drugs Are Necessary, When Alternatives Are Better, and When to Let Your Body Heal on Its Own. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, Dr. Andrew Weil. Thank you. Welcome indeed. Everybody knows that drugs in recent decades especially have saved a lot of lives. They have, for example, saved people with type 1 diabetes with the discovery of insulin. Chemotherapy agents have cured certain forms of leukemia and lymphoma that have been fatal. Antiviral drugs have turned HIV infection from a death sentence into a manageable chronic illness. We also should know that drugs kill a lot of people. They create a lot of injury. They create a lot of illness. And this can come from a whole variety of ways. Excessive promotion by the drug companies mindless prescriptions by doctors, demands by patients that lead to addictions like the opiate addiction. And in your research, Dr. Weil, you indicate that the use of prescription drugs has skyrocketed so much that people today take 10 times as many prescription drugs as they did in the 1950s. And the use of over-the-counter medications has exploded just as dramatically. Before we get into more detail, what if someone asked you this provocative question? Overall, do pharmaceuticals prescribed and over-the-counter kill, injure, and sicken more people than they save and prevent injury and sickness and more people? 
Well, let me give you one statistic. There are between two and 400,000 deaths a year in the U.S. hospitalized population alone directly caused by medications. And this is not mistakes. This is the right dose of the right drug for the right indication, the right patient. And that many people die, making it the something like the fourth leading cause of death in the hospitalized population. On top of that, there's a huge number of very serious adverse reactions from many of these medications. And I also have to say that I think that a lot of the stuff that you see advertised on television is less beneficial than manufacturers claim and much more dangerous. And I think many people are unaware of this. One of the assignments that I give to physicians who come to our center for training is to think about a list of 12 drugs they would take with them if they had to go to a desert island and only take 12. You know, my list would include things like morphine, aspirin, penicillin, prednisone, drugs that have proved their worth over a long period of time and their efficacy and benefits are good relative to the dangers that they cause. It would be not almost none of the stuff that you see advertised on television. Well, advertising on television is a recently new phenomenon. I don't think it's more than 20 years. Most countries in the world prevent pharmaceuticals from being advertised on television because it's so prone to emotional content and seduction and not very scientific. In our country now, the drug companies are spending between 5 and $6 billion a year on television ads, and the Food and Drug Administration is doing a very poor job in policing these ads. Only so one they, other country allows that, New Zealand, and I don't even remember how that got in. It sneaked in during the Clinton administration. There was no debate on it. And I, all audiences I speak to, I ask people to contact their legislators and ask them to repeal that. Direct consumer advertising has been a huge boon to the pharmaceutical companies and a disaster for medical practice. Because what happens is people watch it and they go to their doctor and demand. It's on TV. I have exactly. to have this drug. Exactly. Uh, there was a report in the Washington Post just recently, which you may have not known about, Dr. Weil, and it just gives an illustration. The headline is, a quarter of adults with sprained ankles were mm -hmm. prescribed opiates in the emergency room around the country. Uh -huh. uh, the state-by-state -state review revealed wide variation from 40% in Arkansas to 2.8% in North Dakota. Mm -hmm. Now, is this medical malpractice? I think, frankly, a lot of prescribing of medication I would call medical malpractice because the not only do the medications fail to work, but in many cases, they actually prolong or worsen the conditions for which they're prescribed. And I discuss that in Mind Over Meds, and this is true of a lot of the common medications. For example, the PPIs, these proton pump inhibitors, the purple pill like Nexium that are now given out so widely for heartburn and gastroesophageal reflux. These were never intended for long-term use. If you shut off the production of stomach acid, you can't get off these drugs because if you try to reduce the dose or stop it, the body secretes much more acid than before and symptoms return with a vengeance. So once you start this medication, you can't get off. There was a paper published in the New England Journal a few years ago in which they took a group of healthy young adults who had no gastrointestinal problems put them on one of these drugs for several weeks, and when they stopped them suddenly, all developed gastroesophageal reflux. So the drug caused the problem it was meant to solve. And you say better not to start on them at all. You almost have a no-no on using them at all. And here, because, you know, all over but, TV, all over TV, all over you TV. see next to you. Now, when I grew up, in the late 1940s, 1950s, there was no gastroesophageal reflux. People got heartburn, and they treated it by taking Tums, which is a very safe preparation of calcium carbonate and peppermint oil. And most people, I think, understood that heartburn was your stomach's way of telling you that you had mistreated it, that you either ate the wrong stuff, you ate too much, so forth. Now, people go to doctors and say they have uh, you know, upper GI distress, and Typically, without even taking a dietary history or anything else, they are put on one of these prescription drugs that suppress stomach acid. You also have some strong evidence on the use or overuse of statins like Lipitor, Zocor, and Crestor. Can you elaborate that? Sure. These clearly have their place. They're very effective at doing one thing, which is lowering the bad form of cholesterol, LDL. But coronary artery disease is very complex. There are many factors that 
lead into it. And elevated serum cholesterol is only one of those. I think it's a very sobering fact that most people don't know that half of people who have first heart attacks have normal serum cholesterol. And my worry is that when a doctor prescribes a statin, he or she thinks they've discharged their responsibility, that there's no need to talk to a patient about how they eat, how they exercise, how they handle stress and anger, and all the other factors that are responsible for coronary artery disease. So there are clear indications for the use of statins, say people who've had a previous heart attack. But it's very questionable whether the numbers of people now being put on them, how many of them actually need them. And you say there there are studies showing side effects like muscle pain, cognitive impairment, and an increased risk of diabetes from these studies. Absolutely. Stats. So, you know, actually the side effect profile of those drugs is not as bad as many of the other ones that we commonly use, but there are certainly adverse effects of them. And they are not for everybody. They're being much too widely prescribed at the moment. Let's go to some situation that's really in the news a lot today, antidepressive medications. <laughs> Well, uh, I don't know. Last I looked, something like one in 10 Americans was on a prescription antidepressant. And here's another case where the effectiveness of these drugs is not great. There have been many studies showing that you can't distinguish their effects from those of placebos in mild to moderate depression and even in some cases of severe depression. And this is another example where long-term use of a medication prolongs or worsens the condition for which it's prescribed. You know, these drugs work by increasing serotonin at neural junctions. If you do that, the body is going to respond by making less serotonin and dropping serotonin receptors. So if you try to stop the medication after, say, a year, depression often returns worse than before. This has a technical name now. It's called tardive dysphoria, meaning lingering bad mood, which is the result of the medication. So, you know, many of these drugs that we use, I think they're okay for short-term management, say a very severe depression. But with depression, as with coronary artery disease and gastroesophageal reflux, there are many other methods that can be used to manage these conditions, but those methods are not being taught at the moment in conventional medical schools. And this is why I started the integrative medicine program to train physicians in things like the influence of diet on health, mind-body interactions, the use of uh, exercise, uh, exercise, the stress management, and the use of natural products, which can include botanicals, other kinds of dietary supplements. So with depression, the best evidence we have for interventions on the physical level are exercise, you know, regular aerobic activity, and also supplementing with fish oil, increasing omega-3 fatty acids. And uh, reducing all, caffeine. And Of course. And there's a whole host of other things, you know, that people never think of. There's the whole field of what I call mental nutrition. You know, if you watch a lot of sad movies and hang around people who are depressed, you're going to be depressed as well. So there's a lot of things you can attend to that can improve your mood. And this cognitive therapy is coming up fast in the studies. Uh, tell us what that's about. Which therapy, Ralph? Cognitive therapy. Yes, I think this is a, one of the great developments that's come out of the whole positive psychology movement. Cognitive therapy helps you identify thought patterns that are responsible for moods and then shows you methods of changing them. And it is a very effective, both cost-effective and time-effective method. And I refer many people to it. I think it is a, a great improvement over standard forms of psychotherapy, really one of the best innovations we've seen. You know, psychologists all over the country are reporting more and more patients coming in saying that they're increasing their anxiety, dread, and fear because of Trump and what he says and what he does. <laughs> And that's not a laughing matter. There are a no, lot of people who are, sen you know, who are sensitive to social justice issues, and they see one area after another going downhill in our country. You know, programs being slashed to, to mm -hmm. help defenseless people, environmental attacks, uh, the coarseness of the rhetoric. And I don't think we should shrug that off. Certainly the psychologists are taking it very seriously. Well, you know, for years, I have recommended to people that they take news fast and learn to reduce the amount of news that they let into their lives. That is to say, not to become uninformed. But there are many people, I'm sure you know them, who are addicted to listening to news on television or radio, and as a result, becoming angry and anxious. And I think exerting more control over the amount of that that you let in 
is a wise thing to do, especially in these times. Except for our audience, right? <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we believe readers think, thinkers read. You talk about something interesting here, and some of the people have criticized you for putting forth some conventional therapies that have no bad side effects, but mm -hmm. they say, well, there's no evidence, double-blind study, et cetera, that it works. Well, you know, acupuncture's worked on pain for 2,000 years in China. I don't think they had a double-blind study. But you say in one of your interviews that stinging nettle works just as fast as any antihistamine for hay fever. Stinging nettle. It doesn't have any of the downside of the antihistamine. This is one, if anyone has questions about the efficacy of natural products, of herbals, this is one to try. It's a freeze-dried extract of nettle leaves in capsules. The dose is one to two capsules every two to four hours as needed. It is the best remedy for hay fever symptoms I have ever found, better than antihistamines, with no downside. And if you rely on these over time, the allergies seem to fade away, whereas with antihistamines, they persist. And there, by the way, there is a good placebo-controlled double-blind study behind that. You know, many of the people that make these criticisms and say there's no evidence are simply unaware of the evidence. It may be published in journals they don't read. It hasn't been brought to their attention. And furthermore, I teach that we should get in the habit of using a sliding scale of evidence that works this way. The greater the potential of a treatment to cause harm, the stricter the standards of evidence it should be held to for efficacy. If we adhere to that in conventional medicine, we would save ourselves a lot of trouble. You know, I heard you talking about breathing before. I often recommend breathing techniques. I teach all patients breathing exercise. I found them to be incredibly effective for the management of anxiety for a whole host of problems. I'm not bothered by the fact that there is not a body of controlled scientific evidence on breathing because I know from my clinical experience that this works and the chance of it, it causing harm is vanishingly small. What's interesting is the junk science label can be applied to hundreds of over-the-counter medicines and prescription medicines over the years because they didn't show any evidence. For example, there's been severe criticism of antihistamines, severe criticisms of laxatives that are on the market. Not yep. only they don't work, they don't work, but they actually have bad side effects on you. And Dr. Sid Wolf and his people years ago put out books called Pills That Don't yep. Work and then yep. Over-the-Counter Pills That Don't Work. And they removed, as a result of the publicity on the Phil Donahue show and elsewhere, mm -hmm. they removed hundreds of these ineffective for purposes for which they're advertised medications from the market. So, listeners, it can be done. Good knowledge can drive out bad medication. But what's interesting is every one of those that were advertised for X purpose or Y purpose mm -hmm. but were ineffective, every one of those was based on junk science. And yet, they were getting sold and sold. And just like now, people go into drugstores, they buy antihistamines. They buy laxatives that don't work and harm them. How do you deal with that? I think through education, and this is why I wrote that book, I'm a great believer that if you present information to people in ways that they can understand and connect with their own experience, they will follow it. That's the only antidote that I see. And it's very available now on the internet. I mean, you yep. can go to worstpills.org. That's yep. Dr. Sidney Wolf's publications. Your book, Mind Over Meds, and your website is what? DrWeil.com. And that's W-E-I-L, DrWeil.com. And it's amazing how people so easily can reduce the pain, the anxiety, the dollars wasted just by paying a little attention, a few minutes, a few hours, mm -hmm. and they can spread the word in their neighborhood. You know, we're not dealing with shades of gray here. We're dealing with an industry that gulls a lot of doctors with their sales pitch that's selling you bad stuff. Speaking of dollars, Ralph, I think many Americans don't know that they pay much more for medications than people do for the exact same medications in other countries. Furthermore, the markup on pharmaceuticals is greater than on any other product in the market. And the companies justify this saying they have to spend so much money on research. 
very difficult to get out of them what they spend, but the amount they spend on research is insignificant to what they spend on advertising. And a lot of that advertising and promotion are done with medical journals. And one of the great untold stories is the collusion between medical journals and pharmaceutical companies in which research is published and how that influences medical practice. And you may, I'm sure you saw quite recently, collusion between insurers and pharmaceutical companies to make the prices of generic medications higher than they had been in the past. That's right. They were the big hope for reducing drug prices. The drug companies in this country charge Americans higher for their drugs than any other country in the world, and no other country subsidizes and gives free research and development with clinical trials from the National Institutes of Health to drug companies the way our country does. I mean, what kind of gratitude is that? <laughs> uh, and, well, do you see any danger in the following facts, that about 50% of all drugs in this country are imported from China or India, and about 80% of the active ingredients in drugs are imported from China and India, and there is no manufacturing facility, I'm told, in this country for penicillin. You want to mm. comment on that in terms of national security as well as safety? There may be some of those products that are coming in from India that are fine. I must say, I am, as a consumer, I'm concerned about all products coming in from China. You know, I do not recommend that people use herbal medicines from China because of the possibility of toxic contaminants in them. And I think that may apply to medications as well. What's interesting is the drug companies that make enormous profits and get huge tax credits, huge government research subsidies, no reasonable price controls as there are in other countries, still want to make more money by outsourcing production to China mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. India. And the Food and Drug Administration doesn't have a really big presence of inspectors in China. Let's go to something that everybody relates to. The technical phrase is non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, but you know them as aspirin, ibuprofen, and naproxen. What's your comments? Very effective drugs, very useful. You know, they're the best things we have that are for pain and inflammation that are not opioids. I think used appropriately, which is mostly for short-term management of conditions, they are useful. The problem is that because these are so readily available, people think of them as being totally innocuous and take them for casual reasons or stay on them for long periods of time, and they are not without very serious downsides, the major one being a bleeding into the stomach or upper intestine, and a lot of these bleeds are fatal. There's a very high number of deaths related to fatal GI bleeds from non steroidal anti-inflammatories, and often... These occur in people who have no warning symptoms. It's not people who get stomach upsets or pain from taking them. It just happens out of the blue. And they can have cardiovascular and kidney problems, correct? Absolutely. So I think the point here is to remember these are strong medications. They work. They're ones that I would certainly keep around, but they should be reserved for the short-term management of painful and inflammatory conditions. Now, you're a graduate of Harvard Medical School in Cambridge. Give us your comment on medical education today when it comes to drugs, when it comes to health care, and when it comes to nutritional education. What's missing here? Well, nutritional education is almost totally absent. The total that I got at Harvard Medical School was 30 minutes, which were grudgingly allowed to a dietitian at one hospital I worked at in Boston to tell us about special diets we could order for patients. When nutrition is taught, it's taught as biochemistry, and it's forgotten as soon as the biochemistry exams are over. So I think it's fair to say that most physicians are functionally illiterate in nutrition. It's not their fault. They weren't taught it, but there haven't even been ways that they can remedy that deficit. In our uh, fellowship, our two-year fellowship for physicians at the University of Arizona Center for Integrative Medicine, nutrition is a major part of the curriculum. And I would say when I write treatment plans for patients, the first steps are always about dietary change, things to avoid, things to eat more of, ways you can change. And I would say that I have seen dietary change be an incredibly effective method before you even have to resort to medication. That's one area of deficiency. Another is the whole realm of mind-body interactions, extremely important. 
knowledge of the strengths and weaknesses of alternative medical systems like traditional Chinese medicine, you know, when to use that, how to find a good practitioner. The information about dietary supplements and botanical medicines is almost completely absent. There's very little about spirituality and medicine. There's very little about self-care. And this is a huge problem because the nature of the way we train doctors, many people are unable to take care of themselves and so are not able to embody and model health and healthy living for their patients. And how can we increase the number of primary care doctors? Most of them are coming out with huge debts in medical school and going into these lucrative specialties. But the interface with the patient is the primary care doctor. Well, we pay them more or we forgive some of that in medical school debt, which is crippling for many people. There are some very good studies showing that states that have higher percentages of primary care physicians have better health outcomes. So we know that this is a very useful thing, and we should be making that happen more. Here's another one. It raises the issue, what in the world are the doctors doing when people come in their office coughing and they have a cold? And you have some pretty severe criticisms of the -the over-the-counter medication for common colds and flu. I think most of them simply don't work, and you're better off leaving things alone, resting, staying out of circulation, drinking fluids, and just easing symptoms by you know, things like breathing steam and, and drinking tea and honey. But you know, a worse problem is the numbers of people who have viral upper respiratory conditions who get antibiotics for them. And this is a problem both of patients who demand antibiotics if, if a cold lasts longer than they think it should, and it's a problem for of doctors who write these prescriptions even though they know they shouldn't. And this is one reason we've lost the power of many antibiotics from simply overuse and thoughtless use. One thing that really has troubled me over the years is the increasing drugging of children. And they go to these huh. schools, there's a nurse there, they hand out the drugs. This is almost child molestation. It should be very alarming to us. The numbers of kids on psychiatric medications, often multiple psychiatric medications, is astounding. And we have no idea what the long-term effects of these drugs are on the developing brain. So I would say we're doing a vast experiment with our children, and we have no idea what the outcome will be. What are some of these drugs? There, first of all, are the antidepressants, the whole range of them. Then there are the stimulant drugs that are given for the treatment of ADHD, which I think is vastly overdiagnosed. And there are the anti-anxiety drugs, the benzodiazepines, which are highly addictive. But the one that really just bothers me terribly is the use of antipsychotic drugs. Now, these are drugs that were developed to treat schizophrenia and major mental illness, and they're now being handed out as first-line interventions along with SSRI antidepressants to make the antidepressants work better. You've probably seen these ads on television. If your antidepressant isn't working, you know, ask your doctor for you know, whatever. And to make up for the ineffectiveness of standard antidepressants, we are now giving antipsychotic drugs, and we're giving them to kids. Not only that, but to comment on this drug, Orlistat, <laughs> well, I think that has pretty much gone out of fashion. You know, this is one of these that's supposed to block fat absorption and promote weight loss. We have an epidemic of childhood obesity in this country, which would be another flashing red light because it's being followed closely by an epidemic of type 2 diabetes and will be followed by an epidemic of coronary artery disease in young people. And the answer is not to give a medication that supposedly blocks fat absorption and has a whole host of adverse effects, it's to, you know, think about what we're doing wrong. I would say one of the things that we should be really concentrating on is to get not only kids, but all people not to drink sweet liquids. It's not just soda. It's it's fruit juice. It's energy drinks. It's putting sugar in coffee and tea and other things. If we could just get people in this country to stop drinking sweet liquids, we would be one big step ahead. Do you know, I'm sure some listeners are saying, let's look at it systemically here. We have a fee-for-service overdiagnosing incentive system where the more you prescribe, the more you operate, the more you diagnose, the more MRIs, the more money. Sectors of the whole medical industrial complex make more money. Mm-hmm. So go for single payer, free choice of doctor and hospital, get rid of fee for service. Canada, for example, which looks a lot like us, spends half per capita, that is half, about 40 
$400 per capita. We're well over $9,000 per capita. They not only spend half, but they cover everybody. We're in this country. We have tens of millions of people not covered or grossly undercovered. And they have free choice of doctor and hospital and better outcomes. So let's look at it systemically now. What would you recommend? Well, to me, the root problem is that as dysfunctional as our healthcare system is, it is generating rivers of money uh, that are flowing into very few pockets. It's the pockets of the pharmaceutical companies, the manufacturers of medical devices, and the big insurers. And until we can break the hold of those vested interests on our legislators and government, I don't think there's any hope of movement. And the only way I see that happening is if a grassroots social political movement starts, because at the moment, you cannot get elected to office in this country. It doesn't matter if you're Democrat, Republican, liberal, conservative, unless you have made deals with those vested interests. That's why I keep saying to our listeners, it's Congress, it's Congress, which means it's you, it's you yep. back in your congressional district. Never takes more than one percent organized on yep. your senators and representatives representing public opinion. And, oh, do you have public opinion on your side on this one? <laughs> I mean, people are saying, for example, there is a disease in Louisiana that has 85,000 patients, and the drug company, Gilead Science, is coming in and saying, well, we have a new drug that's going to cure, but it's only going to cost $80,000 a year per patient. And huh. we've heard how some of these drugs are in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, which is a kind of corporate extortion, pay or die atrocity. So again, you think most people don't want regulation of drug prices in this country? A vast majority of conservatives and liberals. It's ripe for organizing back in your district. Otherwise, it's just getting worse and worse. I remember when a dollar a pill was considered outrageous. Yep. Yep. Well, it is getting worse and worse, and it's going to get worse and worse. And, and it's possible the whole thing will have to deconstruct in order for us to build something better. But more people have to get angry enough about the situation, and we have to begin electing different kinds of representatives who are not beholden to those vested interests. And they got to make connections, like Drs. Himmelstein and Wallander put out this report when they were at Harvard Medical School a few years ago saying that 45,000 people in this country die every year because they can't afford health insurance to get diagnosed and treated in time. They mm -hmm. think it's now about 35,000 because of mm -hmm. Obamacare. I mean, how angry do you have to get when your father, your mother, your sister, right. your brother, your aunt, right. your uncle? There's plenty of anger out there, but mm -hmm. it's not organized. It's not organized, exactly. By the way, when you came out with Mind Over Meds, there was no Oprah show to put you on, right? Correct. So you're getting less uh, national media attention because these shows are no longer on the air. Bill Donahue's exactly. not on the right. air. Right. Yeah. So it's getting worse. I keep telling our listeners, with this massive expansion of communication and media, it's harder and harder compared to the 60s, 70s, and 80s to reach a large audience for the kind of message that you have. No question. And it's harder and harder to break through all the noise out there. It, it is just harder. Now, you've graduated over 1,500 physicians from your fellowship training program at the University of Arizona Center for Integrative Medicine. That's in Tucson, right? It is. And if people go to the website of the program, it's integrativemedicine.arizona.edu. There is a Find a Practitioner link there, and you can locate our graduates near you. They're in all specialties, and they practice this new kind of medicine, which you know, that, which means using medication if it's necessary, but really knowing how to use all these other methods that are safer, more cost-effective, and often more effective. And these are all MDs, right? They're all MDs and DOs, doctors of osteopathy, and we've graduated some nurse practitioners as well. And tell us about your programs and, and the 12 volumes. Well, this is a series of books published by Oxford University Press. They came to me and asked me if I would be the general editor of a series of volumes for clinicians in different specialties. So I think we have more than 12 now, but this is titles like Integrative Cardiology, Integrative Oncology, written by medical specialists discussing the various kinds of treatments that can be used in addition to or in place of conventional therapies for the management of conditions within those specialties. So many practitioners are finding these to be very useful, and we have more titles coming out all the time. We have one on 
environmental medicine coming, one on sexual health, sleep medicine. Uh, How would people get these? Just look up Oxford University Press website, and it's the Mm -hmm. Integrative Medicine Library series. You said someday the integrative medicine will become so mainstream in the U.S. that the word integrative will be deleted. It will just be called good medicine. And I hope that's not far off. And give that website again, please. It's integrativemedicine.arizona.edu. And we're now going to have some questions from Steve Scorvan and David Feldman. I'm sure you have more than a few on your mind. What's up? Plant-based diet. If everybody converts to a plant-based diet, is that the healthiest step? I think that's helpful. I don't think it has to be exclusively plant-based. We have a lot of scientific evidence for the health benefits of the Mediterranean diet, and that includes fish and high-quality dairy products like yogurt and cheese and occasional meat. So I don't tell people to become vegetarians or vegans, but I think it is very useful to reduce the amount of animal products in the diet, especially meat, especially beef, and to really learn the basics of healthy nutrition. What about removing sugar completely from your diet? Again, I don't, I, you know, it, that's hard to do. We like sugar, and I think we eat way too much of it. And there's a lot of evidence that too much sugar deranges metabolism. It certainly promotes obesity. So I think that the trick is to find out how to greatly reduce the amount that you take in. And again, I would start with eliminating sweet liquids from your diet. There's a good movement around the country now to tax soda. That's fine. The the soda companies are trying to get minorities organized, say this is a regressive tax. Soda's killing minority kids. But, you know, people don't understand the difference between fruit and fruit juice. And fruit juice is really not very different from soda in its effect on the insulin system, on metabolism. In California, there was a grassroots movement that got soda machines out of public schools. They were replaced with fruit juice vending machines, not a big step forward. I asked people, classic Coke, Coca-Cola can, Mm -hmm. uh, how much sugar do you want? Tell me when to stop. One teaspoon, two (laughs) teaspoon, four teaspoon. By the time you get five, most people say stop. Well, the actual amount of teaspoons of sugar in a classic Coke can is nine. Wow. Nine teaspoons. Mm -hmm. Well, listen, we're unfortunately out of time, but the book is Mind Over Meds. It's a good factual read, and you'll want to keep it on your shelf and refer to it. It can save you endless agony, help your neighbors be more informed, your friends, your relatives, save you a lot of money. This is where readers think and thinkers read, really Uh operate in a very pragmatic, everyday household manner. Thank you very much, Andrew. Good to talk to you. We've been speaking to Dr. Andrew Weil. We will link to drweil.com at ralphnaderradiohour.com. When we come back, we're going to talk about denuclearizing the Middle East. But first, let's head over to the National Press Building in D.C. and hear from our corporate crime reporter, Russell Mokhyber. You are listening to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Back after this. From the National Press Building in Washington, D.C., this is your Corporate Crime Reporter Morning Minute for Friday, August 3, 2018. I'm Russell Mokhyber. Peter C. Wright, the lawyer nominated to run the Superfund Toxic Cleanup Program, spent more than a decade on one of the nation's most extensive cleanups, one involving Dow Chemical's sprawling headquarters in Midland, Michigan. While he led Dow's legal strategy there, the chemical giant was accused by regulators and, in one case, a Dow engineer of submitting disputed data misrepresenting scientific evidence and delaying cleanup according to internal documents and court records as well as interviews with more than a dozen people involved in the project. That's according to a report in the New York Times. Wright spent 19 years at Dow, one of the world's largest chemical makers, and once described himself in a court deposition as, quote, the company's dioxin lawyer, unquote. For the Corporate Crime Reporter, I'm Russell Mokhyber. Thank you, Russell. Our next guest has some very strong opinions about the consequences of countries having nuclear weapons in the Middle East and what needs to be done about it. David? Robert Tigner is a professor of modern and contemporary history at Princeton University. Professor Tigner teaches courses in African history and world history and has done research on British colonialism as well as its aftermath. Recently, Professor Tigner, along with a number of colleagues, drafted a public statement calling for the complete denuclearization of the Middle East. The statement has been signed by Ralph Nader and many other concerned intellectuals and activists, 
including past guests on this show, including Noam Chomsky and Chris Hedges. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, Professor Robert Tigner. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. Welcome indeed. This petition, which was signed by some pretty prominent people, both in this country and abroad, and some pretty prominent academics who know what they're talking about in terms of the history of the Middle East, came out. What kind of coverage did you get? We got coverage in Europe from an outfit, a blog known as Orient 21 Roman Numerals. Uh, It was published in English and in French in Common Dreams and Anti-War, and hopefully in other places as well. Clearly didn't get as much coverage as one of Trump's secondary tweets at 6 a.m. in the morning, excoriating (laughs) some person on CNN. (laughs) I'm very sorry about that. (laughs) <laughs> okay. Did you get anything on NPR, PBS? No, we did not. Okay. This is just the point I make with a lot of our guests, Professor Tigner, namely that the more important the subject is, the less media it gets. That's for unless sure. It, yeah, unless it's something that emanates from a powerful source like Trump, and, you know, whether it's an important subject or not, he gets media. So you got coverage on the Common Dreams, and I'm sure some of the other blogs. Did you get interviewed on Real News Network? I did not. Okay, that's that, that would always. I'm get hoping you. that that will happen. Yes, indeed. Let's get to the uh, statement itself. What's the essence of the statement to denuclearize the Middle East? Well, you know what got me started thinking about this were the agreements, the negotiations, more than agreements. Uh, taking place between the Americans, Trump, and the North Koreans, and also the South Koreans, in terms of the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. And I thought to myself, since there's been such concern about nuclear weapons in the Middle East, in particular in Iraq and in uh, Iran, and very little attention paid to the fact that Israel has nuclear weapons. I mean, that's generally well known, but it's not very much noticed in the American press. I thought that since the Middle East is a region that has a lot of crises and is a tinderbox of political tensions, that making a statement about the denuclearization of the Middle East would be useful and helpful. Well, we call attention uh, we, to the fact that uh, that Israel has got a pretty much a, a pass as far as its nuclear weapons are concerned. Well, a while back we had Thomas Graham on our show, and he was deeply involved for years as a negotiator with the Soviet Union on behalf of the U.S. government and the disarmament agency, the various treaties that were signed with the Soviet Union. And he made a big point of pointing out nuclear-free zones that already exist in the world. And most people are not aware of that. There's a formal nuclear-free zone in South America, which has worked. That's wonderful. And there's one in some countries in Central Asia. And he thinks that there may be one emerging in Southeast Asia. And he pointed out that that could apply to the Middle East. And that right would now, be wonderful, wouldn't it? Yes. Right now, Israel is the only country in the Middle East with nuclear weapons, and they got them with heavy help from the United States, as Seymour Hersh has pointed out in his books and, and articles. Why does Israel have nuclear weapons, and what's its policy in terms of their use? Well, the um, Israelis have nuclear weapons because, I mean, that is the ultimate weapon in case, you know, a country has political difficulties and military difficulties. Uh, And the Israelis have decided that they need, uh, they have many enemies surrounding themselves, at least they regard them as enemies, and certainly they are in in some respects. And so they have felt a, a very strong desire to have nuclear weapons and to make it known to the other countries in the Middle East that they do have them and that they would be willing to use them if necessary. Why is it stated that they need nuclear weapons? They have the most remarkable superiority (laughs) in modern weapons against adversaries probably in world history. 
they have the most modern U.S. weapons. They get them sometimes before the Air Force gets them, it seems. They're getting the F-35 or about the same time. And they have a Navy. They have an Air Force. They have a mechanized army. And it's surrounding countries, even before the turmoil in Iraq and Syria, disorganized, low equipment uh, in terms of modern weaponry uh, in all these countries. Israel can wipe out the Middle East countries with traditional weapons. Why do they need nuclear weapons, which doesn't put them very uh, high in world public opinion? Exactly. I mean, that's a question that you would have to ask the Israelis. But I think that they, they feel that this is the ultimate weapon and that they need to have it in order to be able to deal with their adversaries. Let me make a point, and I think this is a correct point. I mean, I've done some studies of the 1973 war, and my understanding of the 1973 war, the early stages of the war, the Syrians and the Egyptians, the Egyptians crossed the uh, Suez Canal, and the Syrians occupied much of the Golan Heights. And it's my understanding that the Israelis opened their nuclear weapon silos in anticipation of compelling the Egyptians and the Syrians to stop their military advances. So it was primarily so, used as a deterrent? As a, oh, yes, of course, as a deterrent. This was under Golda Meir? It was under Golda Meir. Right. Well, of course, officially, Israel doesn't even admit to having nuclear weapons. The U.S. goes along. They will never say, yes, Israel has nuclear weapons, when it's the biggest open secret in the world that they do. <laughs> it is the but biggest what, open secret, isn't it? I mean, yeah. if you count what, uh, all the countries that have nuclear weapons, Israel is always on that list. Yes. And as a result, Israel has not joined the nuclear non-proliferation treaty so that it doesn't have to allow international inspectors into the country as other members of the nuclear non-proliferation treaty have to. That includes France, England, the U.S. I think Pakistan is not a member. North Korea was a member and pulled out a few years ago. Okay. So what would you advise the U.S. government in terms of getting Israel to belong to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty? I don't think that the U.S. government is willing to do that, and uh, I'm, I would certainly advise them to do so. But it's advice that is unlikely to be heard by any one of the uh, political leaders in our country. In your statement, you say that the Israeli army has been in military occupation of the West Bank and Gaza, in effect, constructively. It's, it's a fiction that it's not occupying Gaza. Right. It's barricading right. it and all. It's, it's seen by international law specialists as an occupation. Anyway, you say the Israeli army has been in military occupation of the West Bank and Gaza for five decades, making it yes. one of the longest military occupation of modern times. Uh, now, this is a pretty hard-fisted occupation. They can go in any time, smash doors down. They have all kinds of checkpoints, all mm -hmm. kinds of surveillance. They have blockaded Gaza. Can Israel be called a democracy with its repression of five million people on its borders? Well, in a sense, I suppose it could be called a democracy. I think I think it's becoming very, very difficult to call Israel a democracy, especially with the passage of this nationality law, which says that Israel is a Jewish state, and it basically disenfranchises the privileges of the non-Jews. There's a 20% of the population in Israel is Arab. And the Druze, in particular, there's an article in the New York Times today about the Druze population, which has supported the state of Israel and has uh, individuals have served in the army of the state of Israel, and yet they now feel as if they're second-class citizens. You mentioned in the statement as well that American political decision makers, as well as Israeli political leaders, need to rethink their political, military, economic, and cultural policies in the region. Well, you know, for over 60 years, the peace movement in Israel, which has included retired generals, retired uh, heads of the 
Israeli FBI and Mossad, ministers of justice, and they're very critical of Netanyahu at the present time. They have never been allowed to have a hearing in Congress. There's never been a congressional hearing in Congress on the peace movement. And at various times, they represented over 50 percent of the Israeli population that wants a two-state, viable two-state solution. What do you think can be done to get some people in Congress to say APAC couldn't possibly oppose these former top-ranking Israeli officials in the military, diplomatic, national security, and justice areas from having a hearing in the House and Senate? (laughs) You think not? I don't think that they would be. I I mean, they have advertised, full-page advertisements in the New York Times and various other journals. And they, you know, so many of these individuals who have served in the military and in the intelligence establishments have, after retirement, they have said that a two-state solution is essential if Israel is to remain a viable state an economy in that particular region of the world. But I don't see that there's any hope whatsoever. Uh, but that wouldn't that, wouldn't that be... Congress would do anything. But wouldn't that be a good program for the peace movement it, for... It would uh, really be a very, very good program. I hadn't thought about that. And that's, that's excellent. It's an excellent because idea. It, because the Jewish Voice for Peace in the U.S. and Peace Now and the Quakers and the Unitarians and Exactly. A lot of retired military officials, even retired members of Congress who are now free to speak out, could be brought to bear on well, this. Let's do it. So maybe that's the next petition that you want to that, that, uh, that's an, establish. That's an, an excellent thought. Tell me this. As you know from your historical knowledge, Professor Tigner, in 1967, the founder of Israel, David Ben Gurion, came out of retirement and made it very clear that the Israelis should withdraw from the occupied West Bank and East Jerusalem and Gaza, because if they didn't, and these were his words, it would be the seeds of Israel's self-destruction as a society and a nation. Completely. Now, why did he say that? And why was he ignored? Well, he was ignored because the right wing is very powerful in Israel, and the Likud party has dominated politics ever since Menachem Begin was put into office. Uh, And the most extreme of this group is uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. Uh, And so, you know, that element in Israeli politics has come to the service. And the more moderate, uh, more sensible Labor Party has seen its uh, influence diminish. Well, why did David Ben-Gurion, the most revered figure in Israeli history, say what he said? And do you agree with that? I I totally agree with it. I mean, really, what is the future of the state of Israel? Okay, it, it can hang on for maybe another century, whatever whatever you say, because it has the powerful military forces. But eventually, first off, it has very, very little international support. Only the Americans are really 100% behind the state of Israel. But even in the United States, I think that the uh, the support for Israel is diminishing. And this is also true among a number of uh, Jewish individuals, uh, very important uh, Jewish members uh, who are uh, not as sympathetic towards Israel as they used to be. Incidentally, I put together a petition a number of years ago calling upon Princeton University to divest from American companies that contributed to the oppression of the Palestinians in the West Bank. Now, it's interesting. This was a petition which was considered by the divestment committee of Princeton University. It was voted on by the undergraduates and by the graduate students. And what is interesting about this is that the undergraduates voted against it. But there was a very, very strong support among the undergraduates. And certainly, it was a a strong minority position. But the graduate students voted very much in favor of it. You know, I think being a pariah state 
internationally is not something that the state of Israel really enjoys. And Well, you know, your co-originators for this petition, distinguished professor of history Arno Mayer and Stanley Stein, along with you, put this out. And Arno Mayer, as you know, wrote this great history book called From Plowshares to Swords, which is the history of uh, uh, Israel and and modern Zionism. Uh, And he didn't get much attention either. It's gotten so bad that I'll bet you APAC hasn't even reacted to your petition. I think that's probably true. However, I'll tell you something. Uh, There is something called Mission Canary. I don't know whether you know about Mission Canary, but there must be a thousand American and European professors who appear on Mission Canary. It is a list of professors and individuals and organizations, and you must surely be on it, who have been critical of the state of Israel. And so, you know, planted inside universities and various other organizations are these individuals who are very pro-Israel, very pro-Zionist, and who collect all kinds of information about people who are critical. Yeah, I wasn't familiar with that, Professor Tigner. We're running out of time. How can people get a hold of this petition and spread it around? I am going to send it off to a gentleman. He runs a blog that deals with the Middle East, and hopefully it will gain a little more foothold. Well, thank you very much, Professor Tigner, and thank Professors Mayer and Stein for their good work here in trying to add another nuclear-free zone to that in South America and other places in the world in the extremely perilous area known as the Middle East or the Near East. Thank you again. Thank you very much. We have been speaking to Professor Robert Tignor. We will link to the uh, letter about denuclearizing the Middle East at ralphnaderradiohour.com. I want to thank our guests this week, Dr. Andrew Weil and Professor Robert Tignor. For those of you listening on the radio, that's our show. For you podcast listeners, stay tuned for some bonus material we call The Wrap-Up. For Ralph Nader's weekly column, go to nader.org. For more from Russell Mokhyber, go to corporatecrimereporter.com. The producers of the Ralph Nader Radio Hour are Jimmy Lee Wirt and Matthew Marin. Our executive producer is Alan Minsky. And our theme music, Stand Up, Rise Up, was written and performed by Kemp Harris. Join us next week on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Thank you, Ralph. Well, what you heard, listeners, from Dr. Andrew Weil should help you or your relatives, friends, and neighbors to be safer when you confront the pharmaceutical industry and its sales pitches. Hi, this is Jimmy Lee Wirt, producer of the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Welcome to the wrap-up. Today we have a little extra with Dr. Andrew Weil, and then Ralph responds to some listener questions. First up, Steve offers an observation to Dr. Weil. I just have an observation I think I've actually made on this show before. I was once watching one of those commercials where they were advertising some pharmaceutical. It was for gout, actually. Mm -hmm. And they go through the whole list of side effects. And one of the side effects was gout. (laughs) 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 Well, you know, kind of the the hair of the dog (laughs) medicine there. You, You know, Steve, that raises another situation is bizarre and cruel. You get people who doctors say, take this drug. And they take the drug. It's not very effective, but it leads to dry mouth. So the patient goes in and says to the doctor, I have dry mouth. So the doctor says, oh, well, there's another prescription or over-the-counter for dry mouth. And then there's another side effect. And people are in this vicious spiral where they have all kinds of pills and bottles in their medicine cabinet. And Tell us, Dr. Weil, what is the synergistic knowledge about when you take different medicines at the same time? We know some of this and not all. And the people who are best poised to answer those questions are pharmacists. I have a chapter in Mind Over Meds written by a pharmacist. I think many people, both, by the way, doctors and patients, do not know that pharmacists are trained to provide a service called a medication therapy management review often done for free or covered by Medicare, in which they can look at the entire list of medications, both prescribed and over-the-counter, that a person is taking and tell you which ones may not be necessary, which are duplicative, where there might be interactions, 
they can't make changes in them, but they can notify the healthcare provider what they think and also tell you about it. And that's a very useful thing to do. And I've had pharmacists tell people, don't buy this drug, even though they're selling mm-hmm. it. So they're very mm-hmm. honest. Some of them right. are, are very, very caring people, and you ought to tap into their knowledge, not just look at them as someone behind the counter selling you a little package. Yep. And now Ralph answers some listener questions. So we've got some listener questions today. The first one, I actually had a little back and forth with this gentleman. He's actually a young dad. He's a listener named Brad Harbor. He wrote to us, he was quite offended by a letter, Ralph, that you wrote to Southwest Airlines recently, lamenting the fact that they were no longer going to serve peanuts on their flights. And this listener, I found out, has a child who is allergic to peanuts and previously could not fly Southwest for that reason, pointing out that one in 11 children has a peanut allergy. And he wondered why you didn't have better things to do than to complain about not getting free peanuts. Well, first of all, because Southwest Airlines had a very successful policy. If a parent like Brad Harper was going to go on the plane with the child, they would notify the Southwest people who are easily accessible on the phone, unlike some other airlines, that there's a peanut allergy, and they would ban all peanut distribution in the entire plane. And that happens about one out of every nine or ten flights. But there's no reason to deny people a nutritious snack. It's a lot better than pretzels when the policy was already working. Now, it failed in one instance when the parents did notify and the staff dropped the ball and there was a bad situation. But what's important to know is that it was a policy that was working and now they're not serving peanuts. But anybody can bring peanuts on board who want to eat peanuts. And therefore, people who have children with these peanut allergies are defenseless. So, you know, which is the best approach? And also, it has a symbolic consequence. Peanuts was the symbol of Southwest Airlines when they started with very low fares. And the founder, Herb Kelleher, said that our fares are peanuts. And so he started serving free peanuts as a symbol. And some commentators think that withdrawing peanuts is the first stage of Southwest starting to charge for baggage fees or for reservation changes. In other words, stopping being like Southwest and starting mimicking United Airlines, Delta, and American, who are pursuing policies of charging you where you sit and when you change a reservation, $200, crazy. So taking a stand for free peanuts was, I think, important. It's not like it took a lot of time, Brad. We work on extremely significant issues, but sometimes you got to look at what you might consider smaller issues and explain it to the public. Thank you for that question, David. Take the next one. This next question comes from Joseph Hoidia. He says, I've been wanting to meet you ever since I went to the Torp Museum of Law. I live in Middleton, Connecticut. I'm a truck driver delivering gas, but would love to do more to help to give back to society. I am currently trying to get a plastic bag ban in Middleton and Connecticut. I was wondering if you can lend me any support to take on this endeavor. Yeah, there are now uh, cities that have successfully banned plastic bags. I think Berkeley is one of them. There's an effort in New York City. You can just Google plastic bag bans, and I'm sure you'll come up with efforts, organized efforts near Middletown, Connecticut, or at least in the New England area. You can go to a nice citizen group called Toxic Action, which has offices in every New England state. It's out of Boston, and I'm sure they will help you get some more allies in this effort. And really, it's very good that you're doing this. Thanks for that question, Joseph. We got a lot of, speaking of nuclear issues, we got a lot of pushback on our episode with Ambassador Thomas Graham, who you mentioned earlier, about nuclear free zones. And this is a representative example, comes from Arthur Milholland. And he says, I was stunned that your nuclear weapons show did not mention, let alone highlight, the UN Treaty for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons that was passed in July 2017, and for which... ICANN, which is the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, received a well-deserved Nobel Prize. And he wanted us to contact the Physicians for Social Responsibility and devote a program to that. 
What do you have to say about that? What do you know about that? Well, that was a, a significant move in the United Nations, uh, opposed, not surprisingly, by the United States, which did not sign that treaty. Over 120 nations have signed it, and now they have to ratify it in terms of their own parliaments. So it's a good movement uh, underway. Uh, we were talking about nuclear-free zones, and we certainly could devote a program segment to the UN Treaty for the Prohibition of Nuclear weapons. That was passed in July 2017 through the United Nations. But it's interesting that not only is the United States in opposition to this, but it wants to spend one to two trillion dollars, and this started under Obama, to upgrade existing nuclear weapons, whatever that means. And that could well be a violation of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which the U.S. took the lead on and is a charter member. This next question comes from Ann Henderson. Dear Ralph, so glad you do what you do. I was enlightened by your program with Lori Wallach on trade and would appreciate a program that I might better understand on executive orders, particularly what, if any, force of law they have or don't have. Well, executive orders by the president are supposed to be within existing legislative authority or international treaty authority and they can elaborate presidential actions under that framework. They're not supposed to go off in a detour and create something new. Unfortunately, presidents have been running out of control when it comes to the rule of law in the last few decades, and they have been moving away from the umbrella of existing legislative authority. For example, President Obama cut the Iran nuclear accord as an executive order, which made it easy for President Trump to revoke it. Presidents often revoke their predecessor's executive order. The argument by international law and constitutional experts is that should have been a treaty. It had to go through the Iranian parliament, ironically, but it didn't have to go through the Congress because President Obama and President Bush and President Clinton felt that they could do all these things themselves, and they didn't want to go through the struggle that might be involved in getting it through the Congress. They do have the force of law if they are lawful, and they have proliferated in recent times, so much so that the first few days of the Trump administration, he spent a lot of time revoking Obama's executive orders. Well, thank you for your questions. Keep them coming either on Ralph's Facebook page or on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour website. And that's a wrap. Join us next week on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour when we welcome back Israeli activist Miko Peled. Stand up, stand up, you've been saved.